Hi guys. Hope everybody can hear me relatively well. The guys on uh, YouTube. So we just started out the YouTube channel first. Uh, our, our live. So, um, the ones on. Can everybody hear me clearly on uh, YouTube? Hi Veru, where is everybody from on folks on YouTube? Where is everybody from? It's eight thirty p.m. in Malaysia. Uh, where is everybody from? And what time is it over there? Alright, so we'll start in a couple of more minutes. Right, can the folks on Facebook hear me as well? Hopefully the folks on Facebook can hear me as well. Alright, so we're just gonna start pretty soon while we sort out the Facebook. So where's everybody from today? So the guys on YouTube, uh, I see we have Veru. We have ten no ten tom. We have Padungu, right? So where are you guys from? Okay, so just let me toggle into this view so that everybody can follow the presentation clearly. The presentation today is a, a very technical one. Um, so for those who have a bit of background. You know, do do chip in and let me know what are your experience of this. Um, so aeration is a really tricky topic. Um, we've been doing this for some time, and for us, it took us even for us a long time to understand what are the exact requirements of aeration. Hey Troy. Hey Curtis. Uh, hi. We have Alba Huang from Indonesia. And we have Muhammad Yogaswara from. Indonesia, I'm guessing, and Sandeep from Florida. So great news. Okay, so we'll start in a couple of seconds. Um, so yeah, a couple of guys from India as well. So India, US, Indonesia. We don't have a lot of Malaysians, I'm surprised, uh, given the fact that due to the lockdown, we're all stuck at home. So the aeration requirement that we know we'll be talking about is uh, some of the key aspects and some of the theoretical framework that you probably would need. Okay, 
So just to start off with, um, so my name is Yit. Uh, for those who uh, who haven't not for, not familiar with our platform, uh, basically I'm the principal consultant for RS Aquaculture. I'm also the CEO, the co-founder of the business. So my background is really design and operating RS systems and how to design and operation of Firefox systems. And we have also bit some background from uh, wastewater. So basically, I'm an engineer by training, and you know, I'm in the company. We only hire two types of people: mainly engineers, or we usually hire marine biologists or aquaculturists. So that's the typical skill sets that we have. So anything in terms of system, grass design, biofilm design, I'll be more than happy to change for people. Okay, so. Most importantly, you have to understand that dissolved oxygen is the most important parameter for growth, right? So, you know, I really like to stress that because having not enough oxygen is often the reason why pond and why RAS systems and why biofox systems are usually constrained, okay? So when I look at growth, I only think about two things in general, right? I only look at genetics and dissolved oxygen okay so this is really really important so if you look at your traditional aquaculture setting right everybody tends to use what we call this surface aerators or what they call paddle wheels right so these are commonly uh, manufactured in taiwan or even china or even locally in india as well so they can either carry a motor up to one to two horsepower and they drive a few paddle wheel that you know sort of creates that aeration which basically brings the surface water up into the air right so it splashes up the air allows oxygen to be captured in the droplets and you know we drop back into the water okay so the type of dissolved oxygen system it's not it's not consistent between ponds for example if your ponds have very high growth of algae and it looks greenish in nature right so these sort of ponds will consume oxygen at night and will produce oxygen in the morning Right. And for example, for those ponds who are slightly golden in color, which is, might be running on the biofox system, depending on how much biofox that you have or how much microbial protein you have, that will consume different amount of oxygen as well. Right. So it's not uncommon to see a pond, for example, a one, one hectare pond running on a biofox system to be running 30 horsepower uh, of aerators. Whereas a pond, similar one hectare, but it's not running on any uh, or not running on any biofox system. They are just changing water. They can be running somewhere about eight to ten horsepower. So you have to understand that the requirements of aeration is not really consistent, right, across different different ponds. Across all the consulting projects that I've looked into, nobody has actually came up with you know a rule of thumb saying that um that yeah if you're running you know x amount of X amount of uh, pond area you need to use X amount of aerators because every pond will behave differently. Okay, so when it comes to designing a uh, aeration requirements, usually we first have to look at what's the current baseline values, right? So ideally, if you tell me your pond is at the range between four to six ppm, that's really great, right? In normal brackish water systems, you seldom go be above six yeah so i wouldn't trust if your readings are telling me that you are getting eight or nine ppm in a brackish water salinity of 20 ppt at 27 degrees celsius right i don't know what's that in fahrenheit so you can probably look it up um so your ideal range is really four to six where you 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 will sort of get unconstrained growth in terms of your shrimps or the fish that you're growing in right so Another you know bad range to go into is what we call suboptimal range, right? Which is around two to four, right? Two to four, will your shrimp or fish die? No, right? But will they grow in an optimum speed? No, right? So it's really a what we call a, a twilight zone where you know where your fish don't grow as what it should be, but they don't die. So it's in the middle. And most of the farmers that I that I see they get stuck in this range because they can't really diagnose what's the problem, and they do, often do not have the means or the capability capabilities to go and diagnose this range but if your if your if your aeration actually drop below or oxygen levels drop below 2 ppm in the pond usually you go into a dangerous range whereby you see all of your shrimp or all your all your fish you know start to come up to the surface okay so these are important characteristics to understand every ponds are slightly different no two ponds are the same right and 
mostly as of now, people usually monitor that, that dissolved oxygen of their ponds at the moment. And do take note that that dissolved oxygen will also tend to change over time based on how your biofilm is performing. For a RAS system, a clear water system, it doesn't change as much because uh, the loading of the microbial loading is pretty consistent. What you only have to worry of is intensity. Yeah. Okay. So how do we, how are we going to measure this dissolved oxygen in the water? Okay. So I'll just give you a few products out there in the market. Okay. And I'll just quickly touch on the pros and cons of this uh, dissolved oxygen probes, and you can make a decision on what you need. So the first and foremost, of course, we have those that are really, really cheap online probes. Uh, I'm sure for those in Malaysia, you can go up to Shopee, Lazada, you know, see one of those that are, you know, price that in the range of 10, 20 US dollars per probe, okay? In my experience, this type of probes, they are not reliable, okay? So do not trust the readings from these probes, okay? So this uh, is not any particular brand that I'm going against. It's just a, it's just a sample to highlight that anything that is costing you between $20 US dollars probes, do not buy it, right? Uh, then we have the second option, which are what we call analytical probes uh, for like for the likes of HANA, YSI. So these are what we call analytical sensor that you know has very accurate reading in terms of oxygenation probe, right? And these guys are usually priced in the range of five hundred to a thousand US dollars, right? So if you're looking in this range and you tell me your probes is about a thousand US dollars, right, or seven hundred or eight hundred US dollars, most likely I'll tell you, yeah, it will probably work, okay? But for us. We actually don't use um, neither of these probes because they're very expensive. What we do is actually use what we call chemical test kits that are very cheap and very accurate, but the downside is it's very laborious. So what do I mean by very laborious? Meaning that uh, it doesn't tell you the reading. You will have to compare the reading against like the current chart that you see over here. So obviously it goes up to 0, 2 ppm, 4 ppm, 6 ppm. So you can't be... You know, it's very hard to read a 5.5, a 5.7, a 3.8. Okay, and you need to you need to be able to distinguish color. So no point getting a colorblind aquaculturist that can't, can't see, you know, test kits like this. So it's better for you to probably get a probe in that sense, yeah? So these are the three kind of probes that we have, uh, you know, out there in the market, right? So how do probes actually measure dissolved oxygen. So this is a really key point that most people do not understand. So they, they just simply take the reading off of the probe. They don't question how is this how is this reading actually being obtained. So that's why it caused problems down the line. Okay. So in normal cases, what we use is what we call oxygen nomograph. Yeah. So how do you read this is you read the, the slanted line called a saturation curve, right? Which gives you zero to hundred percent. Okay. And basically, what the most probes read is actually saturation values. For example, if it reads 100% saturation, right, what does that mean, right? So you have to then look into the context of what is your current temperature and what is your current salinity. So how do you actually use this table is, for example, if the temperature is 25 degrees, at 100% saturation, you will only be getting 8.5 ppm, right? So most of the most of the oxygenation probe that provides you reading in terms of ppm have some sort of temperature and salinity to correlate the saturation values into actual dissolved oxygen values. So this is really important. Know what is your probe reading and know how it's correlated to dissolved oxygen level. Okay. So I know it doesn't mean anything what does, you know, everybody understands 6 to 8 ppm, 4 to 6 ppm in terms of dissolved oxygen. But no, really, not a lot of people understand what is saturation, okay? Saturation it means the maximum amount of oxygen that can be dissolved by the water at a certain point. For example, at 100%, at 10 degrees Celsius, you'll find that it's able to dissolve a higher amount of uh, oxygen. So you can get values up to 10 to 12 ppm right even for colder waters like 5 uh, degrees celsius if you put it at 100 percent saturation you should be getting about 13 to 14 ppm of oxygen okay so this is really important it's very it's almost impossible to exceed 100 percent saturation just by using air aeration alone so i'm meaning air means you're using this, the air in the surface and not enriching the air with pure oxygen okay so this is a really important concept to understand 
So another point apart from it, as you can see clearly, as the temperature increase, you you reduce the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water level, right? So that's not that's not very hard to understand because when you increase the temperature, basically what you are you're exciting the molecules, the gas molecules inside the water, which you induce them to evaporate. So in all circumstances, once you increase the temperature, the water cannot cannot tolerate in terms of holding so much oxygen levels, right? So actually, a lot of people always, you know, try to compare the brackish water, you know, the aquaculture in Asia versus the aquaculture in Norway. You know, why are RAS systems so much more efficient or so much, why are RAS systems so much more, uh, you know, highly automized in, you know, in the likes of Norway or in the likes of, uh, you know, um, in Scotland versus the likes of um, Asia, mainly Malaysia, tropical countries is because it is actually much tougher to aerate a warm water marine aquaculture system as opposed to a cold water aquaculture system, right? So this is first and foremost that is what is important, right? And this is also why most of the you know um, the colder water fish are able to grow up to a bigger size, right? This is because due to the oxygen transfer or the availability of the oxygen systems. In their cold water yeah and on top of that fresh water is actually easier as compared to saline, uh, saline water because if you have salinity in our case like shrimps or crabs you will have to reduce the amount of saturation by by another 20 percent so in theory if it's a fresh water at 25 degrees celsius you should be able to have 8.5 ppm of oxygen in fresh water but if you go to a brackish water system you have to reduce that by 20% which brings you about 7 okay so brackish water systems are really really hard to array okay so 100% just to recap 100% saturation is the maximum amount of oxygen that the water can carry at a certain temperature and salinity okay so when we look at when we look at oxygen transfer or aeration capabilities right we look at two terms right the first term is what we call so we define this as the oxygen transfer rate okay so the oxygen transfer rate is how efficient the oxygen is transferring from the air bubble into the water okay and it's a function of two terms the first term is what we call efficiency efficiency of the aeration system and second is the driving force right the driving force it means how much gradient are the oxygen allowed to transfer from the air molecules into the water itself okay so 100% saturation which we have covered early on for brackish water system is about 7 ppm yeah this is the theoretical maximum that you can get by aerating this with air right and your system for example in which you are culturing fish or, or, or crabs as they are consuming oxygen they will not be at this high 7 ppm uh, all oxygen level there will be about you know in the low case 2 to 4 ppm but as you can see the ideal case will be about 4 to 7 ppm so obviously the larger the gradient right the the more the more efficient the transfer rate right and also you have another term okay so what governs efficiency okay so if i look at the let's say two bubbles over here i have one that is really really small and I have one that is really really big bubbles right so as you might already know that the smaller bubble will be a bit more efficient in terms of generating aeration into or bringing oxygen into the system because the smaller air bubbles for each surface they have actually for each volume of air bubbles that is put inside the system you actually have more surface area right so that's why there's been a lot of technology surrounding things like nano bubble or you have even like what we call aero tubes that you know produce these micro micro air bubbles the reason for doing so is they are trying to improve the efficiency part of the oxygen transfer rate right but the saturation the driving force of between the 100 percent saturation or the amount of air that is going into the system right that doesn't change because you are still using air right just by using air Note that when the air that we breathe in is not 100% oxygen, it only consists of 21% oxygen. So that's why there's a limit on how much do you aerate. It doesn't always corresponding to a very high transfer rate, although you might have very high efficiency. Okay, so this is a really important point to understand. So for most people and most design that I've looked into, the usual, uh, the usual barriers for... Um, Okay, um, one sec. 
for most systems that I've looked into and uh, in terms of consulted for clear water system and biotop system, I always see that the design is always limited by aeration. Okay, so what do I mean? So let's say you have a fish, you have a fish that uh, you have a RS system that cultures fish or tilapia that looks something like this, right? You have a fish, right, uh, that is being cultured in very intensive ponds, and you know the water flow in has oxygen oxygen value of let's say four ppm. After it goes through the system and the fish, you know, sort of consumes the oxygen, the water leaves the culture tank at two ppm. It gets pumped into a you know a tank where you are aerating it or you are putting some sort of oxygenation it right and you're oxygenating you're increasing again from 2 to 4 ppm and then it gets it gets reused again and you know you go up to this cycle due to the inherent fact that most aeration systems are not very efficient what people tend to do over time is to increase the amount of flow rate that is running through this is how RAS system has been a bit, you know, has, how people that are designing RAS has been able to come up with answers like, you know, in order for your RAS to be efficient, you have to, you have to cycle the water through uh, the, the, the water system around the RAS system for three times an hour, two times an hour, right? So basically, that's what a lot of people try to do by putting more flow throughout the system to gain more aeration. But what you will tend to realize is over time, the cost for pumping excessive amount of water is very expensive, right? Because you might see that to ensure that you have ex adequate aeration system to, to, run a, to run a 20 ton water system at 100 kilograms per cubic meter uh, intensity, you might have to circulate the water at five to six times per hour. That means you have to cycle the water at about 60 to 100 tons per hour. And if you size out the pump, that doesn't make economical feasibility. Okay, so this is really important. So if we look at traditional RAS system, how what is the intensity that you know typically we we will encounter this problem? So if you're running a clear water system at about thirty to forty kilograms per cubic meter, you would realize that you know yeah I don't need any I don't need any pure oxygen. I don't need you know to worry about uh, my uh, you know my oxygen because they are all all well in terms of my my do is really consistently four to six ppm okay but actually if you're only running 40 to 60 kilograms per meter cube you are barely even touching the top side of the rs system okay rs systems that are run on pure or good aeration system can reach up to 110 kilograms per cubic meter right so if you imagine you have 1000 liters of water at 110 kilograms per cubic meter means that you are able to put in about uh, you can put in about 200 fishes at weight 500 grams so that's a lot of water that's a lot of fish for very very little water so if you're running a, you're planning to run a raft system that's very high intensity you definitely have to look at aerations beyond the standard methods of just using air compressors or you know standard aeration method yeah Okay. So for those who are in the biofox system, if you're running just with aeration, right, you should be looking at about 5, 6, right? If you can do about 7 kilograms per cubic meter, I think you're stretching it already. But for those who are using pure oxygen system, there have been documentation documentation that you are able to reach up to 10 to 12 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay. So that's a really important distinction between low in low intensity rust and high intensity rust. Although everybody likes to say that yeah, I'm running some sort of high intensity RAS system that can you know do X amount, you know, do check with your numbers how much fish they are actually putting inside the system per cubic meter, right? And if they are exceeding 40 kilograms per cubic meter, there is no way they are doing it just by using air aeration methods. So when we think about high intensity aquaculture systems, we don't try to improve efficiency first, right? Because we know the underlying problem is that the driving force between the amount of using air, uh, aeration using air alone, is not enough to drive a high transfer rate. So instead of using air, we, we change that air into pure oxygen. So when you change the air using to pure oxygen, you can see your saturation point at 100% goes, is not kept at 7, right? It will be kept at 20. So it gives you, so if you look at this equation, you understand that 
you will get a bigger number if it's a 20 minus 2 as opposed to be a 7 minus 2 it will be at least 3 times to 4 times more okay so usually people running a very high intensity rust would not try to aerate using air and they will aerate using pure oxygen okay so where do we get this pure oxygen you might ask okay so the obvious one is to go and start buying welding gas right so that's what we actually use in our farm especially when we were very very small scale right before starting the system or the business we didn't have the capacity to go and invest in all these expensive systems so we started using welding gas at 10 us dollars per you know per ton of welding gas and we were using it you know to so welding gas you have oxygen or acetylene so we were using the oxygen part to aerate our systems right or you could also use one of these small oxygen generator that is very popular nowadays because of COVID, right? To generate oxygen. Okay. But the problem comes if, if you try to use pure oxygen, you would find it's a waste of money. And why is that so? Because if you use the oxygen and simply aerate it into the water, what the gas bubble tend to do over time is just to float up to the surface. And burst at the surface meaning the expensive oxygen that you have just bought just got lost in the system in a matter of second right so what do we do at this point to improve the transfer rate so from a cost effective point what we tend to do is to use other technologies that are not very conventional to improve the efficiency part of the transfer rate okay so the first part the first part which I've explained earlier is to improve the driving force, right, by using pure oxygen, right? But you realize that you know it's very expensive to do so if it's your process is not very efficient. So once you have decided to do that, then it's time to implement technologies that can improve on the efficient terms. So the first and most available technology is what we call the space cone. Okay, so I'll get to the methodology of what is this, how does this space cone actually work. And you can have a feel and understanding of you know the technology, yeah. So the second one that you can use is what we call a nano bubble technology, right? So uh, it has received a lot of you know uh, a lot of very very novel or very uh, very popularity in terms of adoption of the technology, not just in aquaculture but also in the semiconductor industry, but also also in wastewater technology. So I'll cover a bit of concept of that, right? Okay. So if you look at the oxygen cone, um, sorry, uh, if I look at the oxygen cone, so if you look at the previous design, it's actually very simple. It just looks like a fat drum that is slightly bigger at the bottom. So the design is actually very, very simple. What you tend to do with the cone is once you introduce water coming down from the top, basically you will inject pure oxygen along with the incoming water. Okay, as they travel down into the cone, which is has a has a bigger funnel at the bottom, right, and a narrower funnel on top, because of the differences in area, there will be a difference in speed, right? Assuming conservation of volume, right? So with a small area, actually you will find that the speed is actually much faster as compared to a big flow area where the speed is actually much lower. So what it tends to do is Air bubbles that are introduced via oxygen will get trapped in the cone. Why? Because initially coming down, they are facing with a high velocity which tend to push the bubbles down. But as they go beyond deeper and deeper into the cone, what they realize is with the bigger flow area, the water is not pushing down at such a high speed anymore. And hence, the bubble will try to flow back up. So the bubble will be eventually perpetually stuck in this cycle forever until all of the oxygen from the bubble is being diffused out from the cone. So the air bubbles are always flowing down, going down to the bottom, going to the low velocity area and flow up again, goes down and flows up again, much like a ping pong ball that goes up and down in perpetuity until it gets fully dissolved. So when you use a cone like this, what you realize that the oxygen that you put inside the system doesn't simply doesn't simply float up to the surface and just get evaporated or just burst on top of your water surface. And this is how RAS systems at high, extremely super high intensity are able to conserve the amount of used oxygen. For example, 
with the oxygen cone system that we use on our farm running at 0 0.3 liters per minute i can run one welding gas cylinder for a week at our simple holding system so this is how efficient this system is and you know you don't even have to use expensive equipment to build this cone for those who have been following our channel you realize that we were using pvc pipes 2 inch 4 inch 6 inch to build a cone like this right so it's not a very uh, it's not a very sophisticated piece of equipment but it's a very smart piece of equipment right and the second the second term the second piece of technology is what we call a nano bubble technology right so for those who are you know i already see some questions where can i purchase this nano bubble on uh, on on youtube so i'm great uh, i'm happy that you are following up with the current news um Right now, of course, um, there are a lot of variations on how do you produce nano bubble, and our, on our facility, we actually do have a nano bubble system that we are using currently for our shrimp farms. Uh, we have it tried on one of our twenty ton farms, and we will update the results shortly. So the nano bubble system which we, we have on our farm, it looks something like over this. Basically, what it does it it mix so we have a pump so this pump is a really special pump it's called a gas liquid mixing pump that is responsible for mixing gas and oxygen you can't use standard normal centrifugal pumps because those pumps will tend to cavitate with the presence of air bubble and it will tend to damage your shaft and you reduce the, the lifespan of the pump so these pumps are able to you know sort of cope with that amount of uh, a gas inside the system and it, you know uh, while having an acceptable lifespan so what we do is the pump will suck in both water and pure oxygen uh, pure oxygen into the pump. So what we here see on our side over here that you see the pump that is slightly blue in color. But we also instead of buying welding gas, we actually also invested in our own oxygen concentrator that is able to produce pure oxygen. So both of them is actually being mixed by the pump, chopped up into 100 million pieces. Right, and it then goes into a oxygen dissolver. Right, so oxygen dissolver is just a pressurized chamber. It can be up to um, 30, 30 psi or forty five psi, and its job is mainly to to sort of increase the saturation point or to bring up the pressure inside the chamber so that more oxygen can be dissolved in the liquid. Right, so what has to happen is the mixed oxygen will then be pressurized into the water and then is released into the environment. So when it releases into the environment, when accounting to low atmospheric pressure or atmospheric pressure, it tends to form what we call gasification, right? Which is what we call, uh, which is what we know as dissolution of gas bubbles inside, um, inside you know, your average soft drinks. And this is actually how they manufacture or how they produce freezy drinks, just like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, by pressurizing carbon dioxide into your 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 bottle of coca cola and when you open up the cap to expose that coke into atmospheric pressure you see that gasification of uh, carbon dioxide so the theory is by introducing pressure in by inducing pressure we are able to, to sort of solubilize the amount of oxygen and when it's resolubilized or re uh, dissolute coming up from the, the solution it doesn't form those kind of big bubbles instead it forms very very fine and minute bubble that stays in suspension for a long time so once it stays in suspension for a long time it basically doesn't just simply float up and you know gas off of the gas out from the top surface so improving the kinetics or the efficiency of the business right or the or the adoption of the technology okay so hopefully that's clear right so the last slide that I have is this. So obviously I've you know I've, I've touched on the, the traditional way of aeration, which is to use paddle wheels to sort of drive aeration in ponds. And I'm sure all of you have known how to aerate your ponds or your, your aquariums just using simple air compressors and you know along with air hose diffuser. And along in this presentation, I've also explained to you how can we use ox pure oxygen efficiently by the usage of oxygen cone and nano bubble system so among of all these processes which is the best for us right so how i look at aeration is because like many of you i'm also a farmer and i have to pick the best technology that is most suitable for us right aeration or energy cost is the deciding factor when you are 
you are trying to you know select your aeration technology and the amount of energy cost can usually arise up to 10 to 15 percent of your production cost for a semi-intensive or intensive or super intensive system okay um if you are targeting a very you know uh less than 30 to 40 kilograms per cubic meter in a clear water system and as five kilograms in uh, per cubic meter in the biofrog system, I think you you are okay to stick with very generic aeration with air diffusers or ceramic diffusers kind of setup. But if you're looking into a super intensive 100 kilograms per cubic meter system, you have to look at technologies like um, oxygen cone or even nanobubble systems. But in essence, what do we what do we measure for in terms of system is what do I look at? standard aeration efficiency, which is the amount of oxygen we can bring inside the system for every kilowatt hour of energy spent. Okay, so you can look this up, standard aeration efficiency for different kind of systems is already widely published in a lot of aquaculture or wastewater journals. And you can read the different efficiency for paddle wheels, for um, compressor with uh, air hoses, or even with nanobubble system or venturi system oxygen code. So those numbers are already there and I'm sure that you can pick on one that you feel that is applicable for your case and apply it as far. Well. Alright? So that's, that's the end for the presentation. I hope you have learned something with regards to, uh, to aeration. It's uh, quite a technical, uh, technical presentation in terms of theoretical framework and the kind of technology nowadays that are available. Okay, so for those who are interested to learn more, we do have courses uh, with regards for mud crabs or bioflock systems uh, that we use to culture shrimp. And the mud crabs, you can use it to, cu to culture it with what we call clear water rust system. We, do we don't only focus on the theoretical aspects or practical aspects, we also focus on the business side of things, how to understand the technology you are impacting What's the ROI of the technology you're just about to apply? Does it make commercial sense to use to produce crabs or shrimp this way? You know, and that's really important to help you decide. Okay, to help you decide what technology you want to use. Okay, we also provide uh, practical skills. Uh, we also provide practical skills in terms of uh, water quality monitoring and also help you gain access to that. Or suppliers. Okay, so for those who are in Malaysia, you can join our courses in Kwang, which is at thousand six, uh, for shrimp and nine hundred for crabs. Um, I know now we have a pandemic, so most of the online the physical course in Kwang will have to be rescheduled after the MCO. So for those who, for those who can't travel and like to attend our courses, you can join our online courses, which are hosted on our website for one two hundred US dollars for shrimp. And one on nine for crabs, and in the future, if you decided to join our course in Malaysia, you will get a free rebate as well. And we also have a forum that uh, you can ask questions uh, if you have any issues. Um, so this is my contact details. Uh, feel free to drop me uh, email, and you know, uh, drop me a message or drop me an email if you have any questions. All right. So now I'll just go through some of the the questions that I uh, have on. Um, have on Facebook first. So I'm getting one question from Michael PF. What's the best aeration method? Uh, is Venturi good? Okay. So the best aeration method is uh, is an aeration method that has the lowest SAE, meaning it has the amount of highest amount of oxygen put inside the system for every kilowatt hour that you spend for energy. Um, traditionally speaking, the most efficient systems are actually paddle wheels or diffuse air systems with um air hose or a diffuser, air diffuser, but that might not be sufficient for your needs. For example, if your tank system is very deep, it is more than 1 meter or 1.5 meters, you might have no choice but to use a venturi system which works really, really well in, in very high depth, right? Or you might have a system that requires high intensity farming and in which you have to reach intensities up to 100 kilograms per cubic meter, right? So in these cases, you might have to use oxygen cone system or even to use a nano bubble system okay so that's uh that's really important to help you de to decide uh what sort of a system or setup that you you will have to look into okay uh so i'll go on to answer some of the questions uh on youtube as well um okay so where can i purchase this nano bubble system uh, you can purchase them off uh, the, some of the suppliers in China. We do have some models, right? 
Um, but if you are if you are just looking in terms of trial, you can also look at uh, our performance. We will upload our performance. Uh, maybe in two or three months time once we are done with this culture cycle. But you know, just some snippets. I do see our streams growing faster in the nano bubble system. I don't doubt its benefit. The more pressing concern is whether the benefit actually outweighs the cost and how much does it outweigh in terms of benefit to cost ratio. Is it a 3x, is it a 10x or is it just a 1x or 1.1x? And it's just if it's just a 1.1x, you might find that you might it's more worthwhile to invest your money in, you know, other things, for example. Okay, so um, I don't see other uh, any more other questions on uh, on YouTube at the moment. So if you do have any questions, you know, feel free to get in touch with me uh, to sort of understand you know, or look at you know what are the other questions that you 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 have. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's all for now. Thank you for tuning in again uh, today and I will hope to see you again in our webinar session. So the next webinar session uh, that we have is actually on the 7th of, uh, 7th of July. Um, so it will be conducted on Shikin. It will be on a Wednesday night, um, similar to the time like this. And the next topic will be... How to transport live streams and live crabs. So we'll be going through some of the, the techniques that we, we transport crabs. And you know, for those who are doing shrimps, this might concern you because you might be targeting a live stream market and how do you chill the shrimp so that they can revive again uh, at a certain point and how do you transport them with lower mortality. Okay, so we'll be covering covering that in our next webinar session. So stay tuned and I hope to see you guys again at Rust Aquaculture. Thanks again for tuning in. Good night.